I'm gonna go ahead, we're going live. All right, sounds good. And I'm going to, give me one second, I see some people already popping in. I'm going to make us live on Facebook. Okay. And here it comes. Who do we have here? We have Casey and Susan, tried and true attendees. How are you ladies? Kath, Carrie. Welcome. We're just getting ready. This is Karen Amendola who will be chatting with a little bit and we are going to chat with her before our content. I'm just trying to get us into Facebook real quick. Okay. Carrie, how is the view? Because uh, I know last time we had some control some issues with the view. So how's that looking? Terrific, looks good. Okay, perfect. Great. All right, we are right at 5.30 my time, 7.30 Karen's time. I will go ahead and introduce Karen Amendola to everyone watching. Um, Karen, if you saw the post on Facebook, has been a core member of the Mending the Soul ministry community since day one. In fact, I think John was on the test committee, wasn't he, on the with the pastors that were being trained or no? Uh, I don't think so. I, okay. well, I don't remember actually. Details, details, but. I know it was long enough ago that we can reasonably say that was too long ago to remember. That, that is <laughs> um, so Karen is also a friend of mine, and so I'm going to wave that flag all day long. I think we are <laughs> incredibly blessed to have her in this role. Um, when Chanel left and we started talking about who could possibly replace her, Karen's name kind of started floating. And I said, absolutely, she might be too good for us. I'd ask her right away. <laughs> related to that one. <laughs> <laughs> so Karen is the wife of a pastor. I more refer to you guys as pastors because of the way you do ministry. You're both in it together. Yeah. Um, at least that's how I felt when I was in your church. Um, they are now church planning missionaries in New York City. Um, Karen has a lengthy career in the business sector as well. Sales and business growth was very successful. Interior design. She has three boys. Um, as the mom of three small boys, that in and of itself deserves an award. <laughs> and the middle one just got married. Yes, Matthew. And what else do we need to know about you, Karen? Oh my gosh. Well, um, what else do you need? I love my boys. I, they're just so fun. Having adult children is the best. I mean, each stage you love and we are certainly enjoying them now. Um, we're sort of empty nesters. Uh, Mark, our youngest, is in his last semester now of uh, college and graduates in May. Um, and I, I have had a lot of life experience, so there's so much that I could tell you about it, but um, I didn't grow up in a Christian home, became a Christian when I was in high school, um, saw God do amazing things during that time, and it was pretty early on where I knew I wanted to go into full-time Christian work after that, and um, went to college, met John, and we got married shortly after we met. Not normally what I recommend, but it was... Uh, we met, we got married nine months after we met, and a year after that, through, um, through a couple different things, including tragedy, my, the loss of my dad, we decided now is the time, and we went into full-time Christian work back in, that's 1987, so that was a long time ago. Mm -hmm. And um, since that time, we've been involved in ministry in one form or another with Campus Crusade back in the day, and church, and church planting after that, and then moving out to New York to do the same, to help uh, establish churches and train leaders. And I've been doing that since 2009, 10 years. 
So I think the soul is a huge part of how you minister to those people. For those of you watching, I'm, most of you are not in New York. Um, New York is what we refer to as a post-Christian culture, which it's, means that they are kind of, <clears throat> it's kind of like being in Europe where the, the church is not a popular thing. And so ministering there has to be done a little bit differently. And from what I, um, the way I would say it is that you minister um, at a grassroots level, that you meet people's needs, just like Jesus at the, with a the woman at the well. So tell us a little bit about how you do that, Karen. Well, it is exactly what you said. It's just being out with people, We're getting to know people. Like my first, um, my first job here, uh, when I, I, one of the things that I've done is jewelry sales, but my first job, when I was getting to know people and telling them about what John did, a pastor is what I would say, often we'd get a response of a pastor. What's that? I mean, things like from, yeah, where, from where I was in Phoenix, it's so um, part of culture that it was really interesting. And then just trying to have to rethink, how do we explain our faith and what we believe to people who are maybe <clears throat> not even exposed to Christianity? And here in the New York, Long Island, have a lot of negative experiences yeah. with anything related to the church. Yeah, so yeah. it's really just getting to know them, love them. And as they see that we are not crazy, I mean, somewhat crazy, but, you know, somewhat normal. Um, it's And seeing a difference and then sharing the gospel with them as the Lord leads. Yeah. So you are excited. I didn't know this just from chatting with you about taking on this new role and what it might mean for us and some changes that you and I have talked about that Chanel and I had started to talk about before she decided to take a break. What things are you looking forward to bringing to the facilitators to Mending the Soul Basic? Right. Well, there's a, a few things. One, I love what has already happened. So for me, this season is going to be gathering more information to seeing what we can do to expand what's already happened. Uh, expand the reach of Mending the Soul Basic in particular. And then when I think of expansion, not only do I think of geographic, but I think of um, diversity and you know that's really close to my heart because mm -hmm. where we work and the people that we work they're mostly uh, millennials and younger um, mostly non-white um, often first and second generation uh, immigrants so um, that's also part of what I have in my brain as we seek to expand um, ending the soul basic yeah so that's a big part of that and then the other thing is just supporting facilitators because you know, facilitators, that's, that's our lifeblood. And taking uh, Many of the Soul to a new area, to New York, I know what that's like and the fear and trepidation that I had and how do I get the support that I need and the answers that I need. And all of those things um, are so super important and being able to help uh, meet the needs of people as they bring Many of the Soul to their community. Yeah. Yeah, we're so excited to have you. Um, if anybody with us has a, some questions for Karen, she is open to taking them. You can type them in the chat box or in the Q&A box. We're going to keep her on for a couple more minutes, but since she's married, she doesn't really need this advice. <laughs> so she is going to exit <laughs> pretty quickly. Um, uh, so just to backtrack a little bit, Karen is our new Mending the Soul Basic Program Director, taking Chanel Bender's place um, and mine. I've been acting as the interim director, which doesn't mean a whole lot during December when there's not a lot to do. However, this is probably a good time to let everybody know that I also will be stepping away from Mending the Soul to dedicate my full attention to my private practice as a therapist here in Phoenix. Um, I will remain in the facilitator group um, I hope to still be contributing to facilitator support and some psych ed stuff as I have been doing, but definitely not in as prominent a role because Karen is more than capable to do that. Kath, her email address is Karen, like you have it spelled there, dot Amendola, A-M-A-N-D-O-L-A, -A -A at mendingthesoul.org. That's correct. Right? Very impressive. Ah, that's good. All right. Any other questions for Karen before she takes off? She is obviously in the Mending the Soul Facilitator group. I will be um, adding her as, um, if I can figure out how to do it, as admin today before I sign off for the day. 
Um, so you can contact her there as well. I will say this, if you are trying to contact a Mending the Soul employee for any reason, Facebook is not a great way to do that. And I'll tell you why. All the messages get filtered in with our personal messages. So all of those forward memes that your auntie and your sister-in-law sends you get filtered in with Mending the Soul work email. So mm -hmm. if you really want to contact one of us, please use our Mending the Soul web address. Yeah. It's usually first name dot last name at mending the soul dot. So Jean says, welcome and looking forward to what you contribute. And I don't think we have any other questions, Karen. So what I'll do, if you want to check back um, to the post in the Facebook group, we'll encourage people to write questions there too at the end of our no problem. All right. Thanks for having me, Steffi. You're welcome. Thanks for coming. You're welcome. Bye. Bye. All right, let's jump into trauma and dating after trauma. If I had you all in a room, I'd say how many of you had trouble with this, but I think I know probably all of you. Um, because I know I did, and I had some really great advice, actually. Karen's husband gave a sermon when I was about 23 about you should absolutely use a dating app if you're single because it's easier to meet people, and I did, and I met my husband on Match.com, so thank you, John Amendola, for that. Um, but we're going to be talking about some of the pitfalls and um, some of the issues that come up when you have trauma and you're trying to navigate this. And um, I know some of you just based off of who's here today that this might be for um, one of your children or somebody in your church. And so I encourage you, um, this is a difficult thing to navigate. I have a 30 year old adopted daughter and who has uh, trauma. And this has been a difficult lesson and a difficult thing for us as parents to guide. Um, so we deal with this topic with a lot of grace and <clears throat> um, there's no rule book <laughs> other than the, you know, things in the Bible that we can't, they're non-negotiable. So we're just going to have a lot of information and a lot of grace. If you have questions for me, please type them in the chat or the Q&A box. I have everything up. I think everybody can see me. Let's go. The first thing I want to talk about is the mirror. Um, normally I pull, extrapolate a lot of data from textbooks and, and studies and things. Most of this is my content today. Um, so if you want to take a picture of it, just be sure you give credit to me. Um, if I haven't identified that it's from somebody else, it's from me. So developmental trauma and self-identity. We know from all of the things that we've read, Mending the Soul and these webinars that trauma drastically impacts your view of self, your view of other, how you interact, your view of relationships, um, how you interpret the actions and words of others. And because of that, we have had to, especially if you have chronic abuse, if you have childhood abuse, abuse during developmental stages, you were forced to it, develop behaviors in order to survive. Some of those behaviors might have been retreating in conflict. That doesn't work in relationships. You may already realize that. <laughs> it may be very difficult for you to overcome that. So one of the things that I think is really important is to take a really good hard look at yourself, especially if you have already come to the conclusion that you, this is an area that you're not doing well or that you're doing things that aren't working for you. Um, so the first question I'd ask is, what maladaptive behaviors have you had to perfect in order to survive. Maybe one of those things is that you have a real tough shell, that you come on very um, strong and hard and it's hard for people to actually get to know you. Maybe it's that you're super passive or you're a chameleon, you become whoever you're dating. Um, I have worked with a lot of young women that they date one guy and they love Mexican everything, Mexican salsa, Mexican dancing, Mexican food. Suddenly they date someone new and they hate that. And now they like something new. They're a completely different person. Um, that's a maladaptive behavior. It's a lack of self-identity. It's a lack of understanding who you are and what you enjoy, that you just live through this person, that this other person gives you your identity. What did you learn to do in your family of origin and, form and formative romantic relationships to be safe? So I often say to young girls, the first and second relationship you have in your teen years, and now people are dating much younger, which I'm not a fan of, <clears throat> but those first relationships are really key in helping you develop the patterns of your romantic relationships. So not only parent to child relationship, sibling relationship, but also those first boyfriends 
help you determine what's going to be normal for you. And you may have noticed those patterns already. So what did you learn to do in those relationships to, to be safe? Were you allowed to have opinions that were different? Were you allowed to be yourself, however you identify that person? Were you, was it safe to be silly and playful or did you get made fun of? Was it safe to be sad or was that not allowed? Was it safe to communicate that your feelings had been hurt or you felt disrespected? All of those things you learned in the context of relationship and you learned that that is what is acceptable and unacceptable. And now in adult life, you're still doing those things. And if you don't unlearn them, you're going to attract the same kind of unsafe people. Dissociation is a really big one. We talked a few months ago in our um, webinar on predators and how to protect your kids about this instinct that lies within us that comes up and warns us about people. <clears throat> and it tells us this person's not safe. Um, I don't feel right. Something's off. When we dissociate, we're no longer paying attention to that internal barometer that tells us when things are off. If we're dissociating within a dating relationship, we are not able to sense when things are off kilter. So this might happen in a way where you are dating someone and you think it's just great, everything's fine, and suddenly you find out they're married, or they have three kids they've never mentioned, or um, they have a prison record, or something like that. You've missed all of the internal signs you would normally get because you're not in touch with your body. If you have PTSD or CPTSD, there's a strong chance that you are dissociating. Um, and the first thing is to be aware of that and then also to get help for that. Um, negative cognitions, this is a little less serious, but really impactful in your relationships with people. What do you believe about relationships? What do you believe to be true about male-female relationships, about the way humans interact with each other? What do you believe about yourself in relationships? Do you believe you're a bad partner? Do you believe you're um, a mean guy? Do you believe that you aren't able to communicate your feelings? What do you tell yourself is true about you? What do you believe about others? Do you believe all men cheat? Do you believe all women will spend all your money? Do you believe that all women nag? So the more you identify these negative cognitions, the more able you can help yourself heal from those and develop new truthful cognitions that will help you deal in relationship. So let's just say my negative cognition is that um, all men are lazy. Let's just say that's my neg negative cognition. I could be dating someone and they could not be lazy, but if I believe all men are lazy, the first time I see anything that I am perceiving to be lazy behavior, I'm going to toss the baby out with the bathwater. Maybe that person was sick. Maybe they were relaxing. Maybe they needed had an off day. Maybe their capacity for performance and production is different than mine. So this is where these negative cognitions can come into play and really wreak havoc. You might miss out on something really wonderful because you have this negative cognition that is wiping the whole slate with this general opinion that may or may not apply. But you can't really even tell if it does because you just have this tape playing in your head. Again, if you have questions, please let me know. So this is step, this is the first thing, the mirror, being aware of yourself, what you bring to the table. Who are you in this scenario? What kind of partner are you? What are the thoughts, intentions, and awarenesses you're bringing? Okay, so blind spots. This is another thing that you're gonna become more aware of. Um, if any of these things are true for you, these could be a blind spot. I never really had a childhood. This could be that you were heavily parentified and you may have a blind spot. You may be only attracting people that you have to caretake. So you're gonna end up in a relationship exhausted and think it's the other person, but really you don't know how to be a partner. You only know how to caretake. So if that's something that you say, I never had a childhood. I have no memories from my childhood. I've always felt like something was missing or wrong from with me. This might be a lack of self, a lack of, of strength within who you are that you're looking for somebody else to fill. And we all know that, you know, you can't have a partial person in a relationship. It takes two people who are 100% themselves and 100% committed to have a relationship. I'm the kind of person who always dates the wrong people. Kind of becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy 
That seems trite, but it is true. Um, I'm better off alone. I know a lot of people who put themselves in this camp. I just shouldn't be in relationships with people. I get hurt, they get hurt, I should, it shouldn't happen. Well, actually that's not true. We, we are created in the image of a relational God who desires for us to have relationships with other people, including marital romantic relationships. Um, I don't think about myself, it only makes me sad. If you're not thinking about yourself, you're not caretaking yourself. And if you're not caretaking yourself, you're not able to be aware of the things that we talked about in the last slide. Um, <clears throat> and this is going to flavor what we're willing to accept in relationship. I'm not an emotional person. I, I think almost every one of my male clients has said this. She has all the feelings. I'm unemotional. Guess what? You have all the feelings. You just aren't feeling them which means you're stuffing them, which means you're probably angry or you're self-medicating. Everybody is emotional. Every single human being created in the image of God has feelings. Whether we feel them or not is a different question. If you're not feeling them, that means that you're not able to feel good things too. So that is probably a good place to um, start in your healing journey. So Karen was open enough to say, um, all men are jerks. All men want is sex. That was hers. And if you watched John and Karen were one of the first people I interviewed for in our webinar series this summer, and they talked a little bit about their journey and how mending the soul came into play with that. And um, that negative cognition was really impactful on their marriage. You may want to go back and watch that. So step one, what are we going to do about all this stuff? Be aware of yourself, what you bring to the table, acknowledge the truth, tell the truth, admit your weakness. Be aware of your blind spots and appoint people you can give permission to lovingly remind you when they see you going blind again. This should not be apparent. <laughs> I've learned this through having an older daughter um, who said, please tell me if you see me and guess who she doesn't listen to when she's in that moment. <laughs> and we tell her and she doesn't listen. So make sure you have people who love you enough to be truthful. A true friend should be able to be really honest with you and still be loving and kind. And you should be able to hear them with loving kind reception, even if maybe it hurts. Um, if you don't have those kinds of relationships, you probably need to not date and just make friends. Start with making friends. Be truthful with yourself. The lies we tell ourselves are sometimes much more powerful than the ones told to us. Um, for instance, those negative cognitions. Other things can be, I've known a lot of girls who date men they actually don't like, and they will manipulate attachment. Um, because they don't want to be alone or because they need to feel attractive or because they like to feel wanted or because being in a relationship feels stable. I'm sure men do the same thing. I'm not as familiar with that. <coughs> but the lies we tell ourselves like, oh, well, I really like this person or this person's a really good fit for me. When you know you're ignoring red flags are oftentimes much more difficult to get over than the ones that the other person may or may not be telling us. Be a safe person. Um, this comes down to knowing what your wounding is and how it's impacting how you treat other people. A really good book is called Safe People. This is one I recommend for a first read after Mending the Soul. It's by Cloud and Townsend. They wrote the Boundaries books. This will not only help you identify what safe people look like in relationships, but it will help you identify whether you are a safe person. Be always an in-process person. Be willing to reflect on your own patterns and how they may be impeding your ability to be in healthy relationships or do damage to your current relationships. So if you think you have arrived and you have it all figured out and you're busy diagnosing and telling everybody else what's wrong with them, you probably need to back up a little bit and go back to the first slide, the mirror slide. There will always be work to do because we're human and we haven't arrived yet, right? And then be curious. As you acknowledge this stuff, you don't want, you don't need to be judgmental. You don't need to, oh, I'm the problem. I'm the reason I can't have a relationship. My trauma, no, not that, but hey, how can I fix this? I wonder why that is. I wonder what I need to do to change that. I wonder how I can be compassionate with myself. I wonder how I can have grace for myself as I process that. Be curious, not judgmental. Step two, the wounded deer. So <clears throat> this is an interesting phenomenon that victims of trauma are at a much higher risk of being victimized again. So a victim of rape is something like four times more likely to be raped than, they, than 
someone who has not been victimized. So it's the phenomenon of once you are wounded, you become an easy target for predators. Um, and that's not to say that there's something about you that they see, or it's just, I think part of it is our blind spots that we don't recognize danger as quickly as someone who may or may not have been victimized. So how can you be able to protect yourself without cloistering yourself? Here's what I mean. Sometimes because this is true, we hide, we protect, we don't engage in relationships, we avoid, we avoid intimacy. Um, we might even be willing to have sex, but not in intimacy. Um, we might be willing to spend a lot of time, but never share of ourselves. How can we actually protect ourselves without doing those things? The first thing is to build a really healthy community. Make sure that you have people that see you, that know you, that like you, <laughs> that accept you and all of your varied quirks the way you are, um, that are kind to you. This will help you learn what it's like to be liked, to be loved, and to be accepted. The second thing is openness. Be willing to be really open about these struggles that you're scared with that community. Um, or that you're that you have weaknesses or that you've developed really unhealthy patterns in dating the more Healthy that community is and the more open and vulnerable you can be with that community the less these Patterns and dark secrets are swimming around inside creating shame Pushing you further down that road and the more of these people that are in your community that love you can help you navigate a different road speed is really important um, and I think this is a byproduct, not only of abuse, but I think our current culture um, in the day and age of twi t what is it? Tinder, not Twitter, Tinder and things that it's fast and it's basically built just to create physical connections, not intimacy. I think speed is, is a huge issue that we expect to fall in love quickly. We should know right away whether we're attracted to that person. And if there's not a connection, we move on. That's not real. That is a manufactured physical response to another human. Um, that is not a relationship. It's not intimacy. And it's impossible to note all of the things that you need to note about another person if you're expecting to know in two weeks whether or not this is a forever thing. John and Karen might be the ex exception because they John knew as soon as he saw Karen's beautiful Italian face that he wanted to mar marry her. <clears throat> However, they didn't get married that day. <laughs> So I think slowing down and being really mindful about the process is really important. Um, don't jump into a boyfriend, girlfriend situation in two weeks. Um, take your time. I oftentimes advocate for dating a lot of people at once. The key here is you can't be physically involved with those people. What do I mean when I say that? I mean, it's okay to go to the movies with Jeff on Thursday night and go to dinner with John on Saturday night, as long as you're not sleeping with them. Don't sleep with them. Don't make out with them, get to know them, be friends with them, spend time with them, meet their friends. Do they act the same around their friends as they act around you? Then you can identify whether or not they're a person you really wanna spend your time with. But if you say after three dates, I'm all in, this is my boyfriend, you're gonna spend the rest of that time trying to justify that decision. At least that's been my experience. So I say get to know a lot of people, whether that's through one-on-one -on -one dates, depending on your age and appropriateness and your feelings about that, or through being in groups with people. Um, alertness. This is, goes back to this dissociation and being really connected to yourself, being aware of what's going on. So like I just said, are they behaving the same in a group of their friends as they do with you one-on-one? -on -one? Do they drink excessively with their friends but not one-on-one -on -one with you? Do you find that their language and their demeanor changes when they're around other people. Are they totally different around their family? Those are really important things to pay attention to. Um, practice friendship first. So <clears throat> I think anybody that's been married for any length and period of time will tell you all of the butterflies and you know can't keep your hands off of each other and they're so handsome. All that fades really quickly when life hits hard when you've got a parent die, when you've got a layoff, when you can't make the mortgage bill, when you've got three kids screaming and you've covered in puke. Guess what really matters? Kindness and friendship. So practicing that friendship first is going to ensure that you actually really like this person and that they're the person you want around when those things do hit. Step three, toss the list and forget the purity culture. Feel free to push back on this. 
<laughs> I have a lot of reasons for saying this, and I'm going to disclaimer it right now by saying I'm not saying forget about purity um, and don't have an idea and that you shouldn't have some idea of what you're looking for. I'm talking about the girl that has a list of the 25 things that she wants to find in her husband stuck in her Bible, and that's her number one prayer, and she's looking for a guy that meets all of those criteria, and if he doesn't, then that is not the guy for her. Here's what I've actually found. God has a better idea of what you need than you do, especially if you have trauma. So develop a list of what your non-negotiables are. I put mine here. Um, kindness, an empathetic response to trauma, similar religious convictions, same feel. You don't need to agree on tongues with the, your spouse. That's not going to come up a lot unless you're charismatic. And if it is, then maybe you do need to agree. But you don't have to agree on every doctrine in the systematic theology book in order to be married to somebody. Do you need to agree that you worship the same God? Probably. Same feelings about commitment, marriage, and fidelity. This is big. I have couples in my office all the time where one person is 100% committed to doing the hard work and the other one's got a boyfriend on the side. So you do want to marry someone that has the same understanding as you in regards to what it takes to build and work on a healthy marriage. That doesn't mean that um, they have to be six foot five and have blonde hair and blue eyes. Same desires for children and family. Um, this comes up a lot in couples counseling. Make sure you talk about this stuff and that you're clear and you don't make promises you don't mean like, well, I guess I could live without kids. If you really want children, be honest with it about it. Strong commitment to working on the relationship. This is big. Anybody that's been married more than 10 years is gonna tell you it's hard work, hard work. And if somebody wants it to be easy or they're out, your marriage is not going to last and you're going to get hurt. And then this is probably one of the top most important things, ability to laugh and have fun together. If you can't play and the person doesn't make you laugh, it's going to be a rough, it's going to be a rough go. <laughs> um, the second thing you might consider on your list is what might be fun. That's not necessarily a non-negotiable. I speak German fluently. That was something that was on my list. It might be fun if I could speak German at my, in my home with my husband. Um, my husband does not speak German. He did learn to propose in German. So you may not get the whole thing. You might just get part of it. Okay, so the purity culture. I think we all have heard about the book, I Kiss Dating Goodbye. Here's my concern and what I want to say to anybody that read that book that might be my age or a little younger. It's okay if you didn't do it this way. It's okay if you date. It's okay if you kiss someone before you marry them. The thing about the purity culture that that I find frightening is one, that there is someone else that has to approve of and oversee your relationship with another person and, and in a way even strategize that. So <clears throat> if you're the parents of young people and you are encouraging courting and encouraging that you be a part of that, here's what I wanna say to you. I think it's great to wanna protect your kids. I think it's great to wanna watch them you would be better off teaching your young women and your young ladies and your young daughters how to identify a good partner and better off teaching the young men in your life how to identify a good partner. Because you being in the mix or as a person that's dating, you requiring that person to tell you whether or not it's good or bad means you are not feeling those things in yourself. You are not saying this is how this person sees me, this is how this person talks to me. This is how I feel when I'm around this person. I don't feel good. Um, I, feel I don't feel safe. Um, I think we should spend more time teaching our kids what are the identifiers of someone who's safe? What are the identifiers of someone who's gonna lift me up and be an encourager and help me grow? What are the identifiers of someone who might actually be an abuser? Because those abusers tend to look really good in purity, in purity culture. That's my disclaimer on that. Um, I think it's actually really good to spend time dating minus sex um, to get to know people and see how they interact in different social situations. Step four, mindfulness. Um, you're welcome, Sarah. Um, I'll just say this as an aside. Growing up in an abusive situation um, with a single parent who was mentally ill um, and in poverty with my story, um, when that book came out, it was a slap in the face because guess what no parent is going to choose for their son? This. And they'd be missing out. 
So if you are that girl or that guy, don't let this view that's been propagated in a lot of churches get in the way of God providing a partner for you. So that's just my disclaimer on that. <clears throat> Step four, mindfulness. This is really, really, really important if you have any kind of trauma. And this is part of the slowdown. Take the time to ask yourself, as you're getting ready for a date with this person, what is my body feeling? Am I anxious? Do I feel safe? What am I telling myself? What am I telling myself about who I need to be? What am I allowed to say? Can I be honest? Is this anxiety fear? Is it fear being created by the other person or is it my own fear that I'm not gonna be accepted? Slow down enough that you can hear yourself, that you can ask yourself these questions and hear what the answers are. So from my own experience, when I was dating my husband, it was not a flash in the pan. He was just super nice. And so I was dating a couple other people and I was having fun. And I realized after about three months of dating him, he hasn't ever made me cry. I actually really like this guy. Like, he's really nice and we have a lot of fun together. And I had never had that experience for that length of time in a dating relationship. And that's what made the switch for me too. I think I should just spend time with him and see how it goes. Um, but I wouldn't have noticed that if after two dates, I said, I just want to date you because I would have been so focused on making a relationship out of it that I wouldn't have noticed the little things he did. Like he always noticed when I had new earrings on, or if I did something different with my makeup, it was the little things. I wouldn't have noticed that about him if I was focused on making it something. I hope that makes sense. Um, so slow down, ask yourself questions. Your feelings are valid, be curious about them. So you might feel like someone is being really mean. They might not be really mean. They might be communicating in a way that it makes you uncomfortable. Your feeling is valid, be really curious about where it's coming from. So even with a safe partner, a trauma survivor may experience depression. So just because you're depressed doesn't mean that the person's not a good partner. Um, you might develop compulsive behavior, an eating disorder, substance abuse, or use, um, difficulty regulating your emotions. Um, you might have flashbacks and panic attacks in the context of, a, of an intimate or romantic relationship that you do, don't, don't expect. Um, and this can happen with a safe person. You might even experience suicidality if that's something that you carry in your history. Um, you might seek or carry out the adverse behavior that you experienced as a child. As a child, So if you've determined that this person is a safe partner and these things come up, you need to see a therapist. You need to deal with where those things are coming from. All of that trauma has a root and healing that root is really important. So if you've done Mending the Soul and now you're in a relationship, take the time to caretake yourself and, and spend time with a therapist to deal with whatever is coming up in that context. Um, know your triggers. So heightened reactions to a common relationship issues. I always say whenever a reaction is way bigger than the situation calls for, um, like for instance, somebody leaves their shoes in the area where you're walking and instead of just saying, hey, I'd really appreciate it if you put your shoes over here or like, oh, I tripped. Can you be more careful if there's yelling and throwing things and screaming and you don't love me because you put your shoes there? That's probably a trauma response. Um, any reaction that's heightened to a common thing that happens in every relationship is probably a trigger. So emotionally fueled disagreements, withdrawal or distant unresponsive behavior, if someone's stonewalling you or giving you nothing. If you're shutting down and just not talking, guess what? That's not healthy. Aversion to conflict and inability to talk through issues, assumptions that the partner is against you um, when that's not necessarily the case. Um, people should be able to have criticisms, things that they don't like, even with people that they love and want to be around. It's part of being human. And if you're a safe person, you'll be able to hear those things without attacking your partner. Lingering doubt about their love and faithfulness difficulty accepting love despite repeated assurance. So these are the kinds of things that can really shipwreck a really great relationship. If you find yourself doing them, it is the onus lies on you to fix it. The other person can never love you enough to fix your trauma. That's all you. 
tips from a therapist. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, one, have a really good support system for each of you. Each person should have their own support system and the relationship. So I recommend that girls and young women and even older women, that you have a group of women that know you and will be able to tell when you are not being true to yourself and your own values. And he should have the exact same thing. I have a lot of girls say to me, he has no friends. If a man has one good friend he can talk to, he has friends. It only takes one for a man. Women are different. Don't expect a man to be just like you and do community like you in order to be healthy. So let him be in charge of him and you be in charge of you. And men, same thing. You be in charge of you and she's in charge of her. <clears throat> and the two of you should be involved in community together, whether that's at a church um, or a Bible study. I don't recommend unmarried people have a Bible study together alone. I think that's a lot of intimacy to then not expect to be in bed together. I can't tell you how many people I know started a Bible study with their boyfriend and they were having sex after the Bible study. When we have emotional intimacy and spiritual intimacy and relational intimacy, guess what naturally we desire? Physical intimacy. So some things, you can be in a Bible study with other people and your boyfriend or girlfriend, but I, this is the mom in me that says, I back off of that a little bit and make sure that it's not too deep if you're not married. Um, make time for family and friends who are positive about your relationship and have respect for you and your loved one. If you have trouble finding people who are positive about your relationship, there might be a reason. Um, be willing to listen to those people. Find a trauma-informed therapist to guide you as a couple if you're engaged or um, married or as individuals in your effort to better understand yourselves and each other. Take time for psychoeducation. Learn about the nature of trauma and self-care and healing techniques like mindfulness. So I've said a little bit about sex. I'll say a little more about sex. What just happened? I lost my slide. So where is this? Okay. <clears throat> so the Bible is really clear on this. And I've noticed um, in my lifetime a shift that the church seems to be really accepting of people having sex. Like it's just something we can't stop people from doing. The Bible is really clear. Sex outside of marriage is not good for us. And there's lots of reasons for that. Science even underscores that. Monogamous married couples experience more sex and more satisfying sex, higher rates of orgasm than people with multiple partners. And that's not to say you're not gonna have good sex if you get married. It's also not to say that if you were a virgin when you got married, you're gonna have great sex. It, it's just a general thing. Like, you know, the rate of mortality is 75 years old. That doesn't mean you can't live longer than that. <laughs> sex before marriage, um, or cohabitation does have a statistical impact on the success rate of marriages. I will say as our culture shifts, this shifts. Um, I think as our culture becomes more accepting of cohabitation, it actually is shifting. Um, be that as, as it may. The trauma, especially sexual trauma, is complex. And you may find yourself participating in behaviors that you hate. You may find that no matter how hard you try, you end up having sex with people that you're dating. And that you say from the very beginning, I'm not gonna do it, I'm not gonna do it, I'm not gonna do it, and then you end up doing it. Um, this could be trauma. It could be a lot of different things. Um, be gracious with yourself. Give yourself the ability to admit that you're not able to solve it on your own. Um, you cannot manage that kind of behavior. You do need the help of a therapist. You do need the help of community. Forgive yourself and work through the shame you carry around this topic. So a lot of people find that they can't forgive themselves. Um, they find that they have labeled themselves as dirty or wrong um, and that they'll never be good enough for a good Christian man or woman. Um, it's covered in the blood. Don't qu keep swimming in it. Um, figure out how you can forgive yourself. And maybe that means having the group of women that you're closest to demonstrate that forgiveness and compassion to you. Um, I'll also say this, um, just because somebody has a past of promiscuity doesn't mean that they can't be a good, good Christian partner. Um, so as much as we're gonna forgive ourselves, we'll be gracious with other people.
I'm hitting a lot of controversial stuff and there's no questions. So either you're totally with me or you've decided I'm crazy. And <laughs> it's probably good that this is my last webinar for a while. Feel free to type in questions if you have them. So how to keep those physical boundaries. These are the rules that I had in place for myself um, and that I have encouraged our children with as well. The first one is, especially in the day and age of um, online dating, and there's this perceived intimacy of um, we we're sending these messages back and forth and we've talked and I totally know, no, you don't know this person. Drive yourself for a while. If you're really attracted to the person, keep driving yourself. Um, don't meet at anybody's home. That means one thing. It meant the same thing in 1923 and it means the same thing today. You don't need to be sitting on a couch watching TV. You need to be bowling. You need to be having a picnic on the side of a mountain. You need to be doing things. Meet in public places. Meet during the day. Meet in end dates before midnight. Anybody over 25 will tell you, my mom said all that stuff and she was right because she knew. Don't participate in sexualized conversation or language. If the person you're talking to is always going in this direction, that's a red flag, a huge red flag. Limit, limit physicality for a while. I would recommend until you know the person. Um, and I'm talking about kissing. Nobody says you has to, have to kiss on the first date. Um, I didn't kiss my husband for quite a while and uh, it would actually became a joke. <coughs> um, I met my husband on match.com and on the second date he tried to kiss me and I said no. And I had to say, I really like you, I'm not there yet. And he never initiated that again until I was ready. But he didn't stop dating me. So kudos to him. And if he did, thank you for letting me know who you are. Um, plan not to be physical. I think a lot of times we think we're planning not to be physical, but in reality, we're setting up scenarios where it could happen. So that's part of being honest. If that's what you're doing, you need to be really honest that that's what you're doing and then change that if you really don't want to do it, right? So I think sometimes there's also parts of us where part of us really does want that kind of a relationship that honors God and that honors self and that does it the right way. And then that also there's this part that doesn't trust that. Will anybody ever really want me if I don't do that? I'm going to be the weirdo. So be honest about that. Talk about it. Be open about it. This is really big, especially for girls. So I think it's Matthew McConaughey that's quoted as saying, the quickest way to get a girl in bed is to tell her you're not going to have sex with her. Why is that? It becomes a challenge. Um, I was part of the purity culture. I didn't have sex. The only person I've been with is my husband. Um, and I did find, especially once I was of legal age, that if I said, oh, I'm not having sex until I'm married, it became an epic battle to keep that person away from me. Um, I feel like once you say those words, that's all the other person thinks of, whether they're male or female. So I would actually not say it and just do it. Commit to it in action, otherwise your words are meaningless anyways. You don't actually have to tell anybody about that when you're first dating them. That's a really intimate decision, a really personal decision. And if the expectation is that you're gonna be sleeping with them right away, they're probably not the kind of person to have the kind of relationship you're looking for. In other words, if you have to tell someone that, they clearly don't have the same goals as you in this area. So just shh, and then follow all the above rules and it's off the table. It's not even on the table because you're not in a place to do it. You're not talking about it. You're just getting to know each other. Um, that's my advice. <laughs> um, I have some of you saying totally with you. So thank you for that. And I'm open for questions. If you have any questions, Any questions? Let me pull up Facebook if I can. Pull up questions from there. If you have a question, can you type it into the Q&A rather than the chat? Because, oh, there's the chat. Actually, I found it, so you can type it into either. Agreed, purity culture sets up an abused person to continue to have no voice. Yep, Karen's on board. Any other questions? I know we have some gentlemen in the room. I do think, I've had a lot of people ask um, 
about, um, you know, when do I tell a person about my trauma? When do I tell a person about trauma? How do I gauge whether or not they're gonna understand my trauma? I think a lot of that depends on um, what your trauma is and if it comes up. So if it doesn't come up naturally, you don't need to sit down and tell everybody your life story. You wouldn't do that with a coworker. So don't do it when you're just getting to know someone you're dating. Um, I think that sometimes as trauma victims, especially if you have chronic and, and longstanding trauma and it's become a part of your identity, you feel like you have to give a person like, here's all my junk. Could you maybe still like me? No, everybody comes with baggage. Just be yourself. Let them get to know you in a natural way. Um, and then if they, if, if you find that they're safe and it comes up, then have that conversation. Um, I remember my husband and I watched a movie that was kind of like Dangerous Minds with Michelle Pfeiffer and I taught at a school like that because of my trauma, because that's where people with trauma go. Um, <clears throat> and his reaction to it really bothered me because of my trauma. And um, I got really mad at him and he had no clue like why I was getting mad. And I finally, after a day or two said, hey, this is what happened for me. This is what I think you were saying. He's like, that's not what I was saying. And so it became a conversation. That's how that comes up naturally. If I had sat him down on the first date, he would have been like, mm, that's a little much, right? But because it came up naturally in the context of getting to know each other, and it taught us like, hey, I might sometimes misunderstand you because I have this other stuff. And you might misunderstand me because of your stuff. And so that's how those things are supposed to come up in relationship. But if you've decided on date two, you're gonna be boyfriend and girlfriend, and you're gonna be in it to win it, that's almost impossible. You are not creating enough space for that stuff to come up organically so that it is safe to talk about. Now, later on in our relationship, I actually had my husband read different chapters of Mending the Soul to say, hey, I don't know how to explain this in a way that I don't feel like a therapist or like I'm teaching you. Would you be willing to read a couple of chapters of this? I didn't hand him all 300 pages and say, read this or I won't date you. So I think organically sharing your story in a way that is honoring to your own vulnerable, what the vulnerability required for it. And then also gauging their commitment level at an appropriate time in the relationship to see if they're willing to become trauma-informed if they are not already. Kath, um, this would have been so helpful when I started dating before I met my husband 32 years ago. We'll share this with others. Oh, I'm so glad to hear that. I would have liked this information before I ever went on a date. <laughs> Um, my trauma is compounded by my daughters, which I caused by bringing a predator in my home. He was our pastor. Oh. That's big. That's really big. And I would highly suggest um, some therapy because here's what I know to be true. Um, mending the soul is super helpful. There are some things that are deeper that require that you give yourself the one-on-one -on -one attention that you need and that your daughter needs. And that might mean um, a financial sacrifice, it might mean a time sacrifice, but there is healing involved and there is healing waiting for you. Um, and if you can develop a community of people around you that are trauma informed and loving and accepting, I think you will find that that awaits you. And it's okay to be immobile for a while that's okay. That's kind of where healing can happen sometimes is when we are still with the pain. Any other questions? Facebook. Oh, there's a ton on Facebook. It's okay to ask questions to a guy. I don't know if I, are you saying like, it's okay to ask a guy out? Is that what you're saying, Jay? I think you have to go with what your conviction is. <laughs> I don't know that I believe in the rules of dating. I am, I married an old fashioned Texan. I collect antique etiquette books. So I'm a little bit more traditional in that area. Um, I also really needed to know that I was wanted. And so I chose not to ask out guys. That's my personal choice. I'm not going to pass judgment on anybody else.
I mean, it's okay to find out and go, he is by asking. Okay. I'm not sure I understand, but yes. I'll say yes to that. <clears throat> All right. Any other questions? Kathy, absolutely. Coming, part of this is coming to believe that you are worth having a good partner. Absolutely. Yes. It doesn't matter. Our pastor says it doesn't matter what's been done to you. It doesn't matter what you've done. None of that matters. God still loves you. And you know what? Even as broken as we can be and as, as hurt as we are, people, we're all broken. <laughs> so you don't have to feel like your brokenness and your pain keeps you in the undesirable pile. It does not. It absolutely does not. Yes, it's okay to get to know him. Okay, so Jay on Facebook is saying, it's okay to ask questions to get to know a guy. Yes. In fact, I would spend a lot of that time when you're not having sex actually talking. I would absolutely do that and ask hard questions. Yes. All right, guys. <laughs> I'm not disappearing. I'm still going to be on Facebook. Karen wants me to stick around. I may even do the occasional webinar. I will say this. I do a lot of this content on my own social media. I'm on Instagram at, at Steffi Butler, which is my professional page. So if this kind of stuff interests you. Um, a lot of the content that I bring here is content that I've developed for that. So you can follow me there. Um, and again, I'm still in the facilitator group. I'm still passionate about Money in the Soul. Um, my kids just need to see their mom more. So <laughs> um, please reach out. I've loved being in this role and I love Money in the Soul and I will make sure I stick around a little bit. Okay, you guys are gonna love Karen. Um, let's give her a big welcome. I think she's still on and um, yeah, I'm just excited about this next chapter for Mending the Soul. So thank you all for your support and feel free to share all the webinars with anybody and everybody you know. Have a great night. Happy New Year.